Last week, I hope that you remember, as I'm sure you all do, that we read a story from a few chapters prior of how Esau rashly sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a bowl of stew. Esau's reckless, hunger-driven decision set in motion the countercultural promise that God made to his mother, Rebekah, that her older son would serve the younger son. Esau unknowingly chose the path that God foreknew. Jacob chose what God knew was going to happen. Despite this, the following chapters show that this simple verbal contract might not have been formally recognized by everyone involved. I'm going to confess here, how many of y'all have watched the Judge Judy before? Okay, I was going to say, I didn't see any hands at first. I was like, I know y'all have watched Judge Judy one time. Judge Judy, I don't know if you've seen this, but if you come in and say, well, we verbally agreed to such and such, she says, prove it. A lot of times verbal agreements don't really help us out too much. And it seems like that even if Esau sold his birthright verbally, I mean, Jacob didn't have a whole lot to stand on here. Though Esau had sold his birthright as the oldest son and sold his birthright to the heir of the promise of God, his father, though, still acted as if he hadn't, right? He charged him to hunt and to prepare a meal for him so that he could go ahead and give him his eldest son blessing anyway. Jacob and Rebekah got wind of this plan, and they beat Esau. They beat him at what he was supposed to be good at, deceiving the nearly blind Isaac to bless Jacob instead. Despite the promise of God, despite Esau's regard, disregard for his own birthright, News of this deception, of this trick, enraged Esau. And he decides that after his father dies, which looks like it's going to be very soon, he will kill his brother Jacob. Rebecca, thankfully, once again hears of this plan and acts to protect Jacob, convincing her husband Isaac to send him to their ancestral home to find a wife. I say all this because it's important to remember the context of this story. After all, Jacob's vision here of a staircase between earth and between heaven is one of those biblical images that has gripped the imagination of both religious and secular artists alike. After all, how many other biblical images do you know of that our, the great Led Zeppelin has written a song about? But those artists often just consider this image on its own. It's a cool image, right, of the staircase going up all the way to heaven. But they neglect that it's just one point in both this one man's life, but even more importantly, the story of God. Consider where Jacob is. For the first time in this narrative, for the first time of the story that we know of Jacob's life, He's on his own. He has no entourage with him, no family. He severed almost all of the connections back to his family. His father resents him for deceiving him, and his brother literally wants to murder him in retaliation. His mom's not there to look out for him. His future hinges on this journey. He has to stay safe in a dark and a scary world. Imagine what it was like to travel in a world before expressways, before hotels, before restaurants. He has to then, somehow, convince a woman to marry him with no proof of who he is or that he can even provide for a family. And then on top of that, remember what we read last week. Remember, as Genesis 25 reports, Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. He was a homebody. This homebody was suddenly alone, out on the road, fending for himself, away from the comfort and the protection of home. Imagine what it was like for Jacob as he began this long, long journey. 
And so, scared, alone, uncertain, he laid upon the ground, head on a rock. That's a fancy pillow, isn't it? And yet God gave him a vision. God showed up in just the way that Jacob needed in that moment, demonstrating that God wasn't as far away as Jacob might have thought. God showed Jacob through this dream that heaven and earth were connected. God used this night to remind Jacob of the promise of God that does not hinge on Jacob's own faithfulness. Despite all of the deception, all of the estrangement that Jacob's actions had caused, God would fulfill the promise made to Abraham and Isaac. In that moment where Jacob must have felt so, so alone, God assured him that God himself was right there alongside him, journeying with Jacob. God would always be there with him, no matter where that journey took him. Scripture tells us that upon awakening from this vision, from this dream, Jacob realized that this moment was more than just an ordinary dream, but a holy message from God. Indeed, Jacob declared that God was present in this place. This place was for him a place of encounter. So he made a shrine there to God, declaring that place a house of God. I've said it a lot. The Hebrew word for place is repeated at least six times in this chapter. The physical, tangible place of encounter with God needed to be remembered. This moment was so important to Jacob that he established a shrine there, something he and other people could then see and be reminded of God's work and God's promise. He made a physical marker to remind him of this spiritual landmark in his life. Bethel then continued to be an important place of worship throughout the Old Testament tradition. Have you had moments like Jacob? What are those times in your life where you felt most at your wit's end and God showed up? God met you in some special way and helped you to see that he was really right there with you. What have been those moments when you have known that God is real? And how do you remember those moments? One of the gifts of having served and now serving in a rural congregation with rich history is to hear some of the stories of church's past. I was telling someone recently about the pride that my first church had in often retelling the story of their parents and their grandparents literally lugging lumber up from the Avon Harbor to build their church facility. The founders of the church thought that having a place to worship was important enough to really sacrifice for. What about our history here at Salem? Do you think back often to the legacy of this congregation? All the way back, even before our country's official founding, there is a history of people meeting here to worship. Do you ever wonder what happened that convinced them to sacrifice land and lumber and labor to build a house for God? To rebuild that house after it was rebuilt the first time, to renovate and expand it. What motivates us, and there are a lot of people involved in this work, to still maintain this place today? Do you ever think about what got this movement started and what's kept it alive? Salem is one of the oldest churches around, and it's rich in history. I walk in those doors, and I think about the thousands of people who've passed through them. The thousands of people who've come in and met God right in these same pews. I love to drive up, especially on that side of the church, and to look towards the rolling hills out in the back and to see so many gravestones. A testament 
to the great cloud of witnesses that very literally surrounds this place. I look out today on your faces and I imagine those who are worshiping at home and I think about your fathers and mothers and your grandfathers and grandmothers on and on and on back whose legacy is reflected both in this place but also in you. Maybe we don't know the details today, but this place, this physical place, this building is a testament to how God has been at work in this community for generations. Remember, Jacob marked Bethel as a place of worship because it was there that he saw heaven and earth connected. That's what we celebrate here too, isn't it? This church should be a reminder of who Jesus is. The one who bridges for us the divide between heaven and earth, between creator and created. What work of God do you remember when you come in this place? Or even when you drive by. I know a lot of us go by here to go to the store or to go to work or to go visit somebody. What is it that you remember when you look at this place? What do you remember when you come in? We read today the story of Jacob, who was a sinful man, who God was still faithful to bless. In a lot of ways, his encounter at the place Bethel helped to change the course of his life, leading him to be who God called him to be. Even one day, as if you keep reading the scriptures, you'll see, reconciling with his brother Esau. Notice that the scriptures tell us this encounter with God also left him afraid. Did you hear Debbie read that? He was afraid. God grabbed his attention there. God helped him see that his life had to change. He couldn't keep being who he was. This selfish, sinful man who met God that night on the road would eventually one day be called Israel, father to the twelve tribes. For many of us here, Salem is our spiritual home. It's been our family's spiritual home for generations. Many of us remember vacation Bible school and Sunday school growing up. Many of us remember maybe a wedding here. Surely a funeral or two. Moments that define our lives. Moments that shape our faith. That change who we are as people and as children of God. We mark these encounters with this place. I encourage you then in a special way, take care that when we enter here, or again, even as you just drive by on Salem Church Road, to remember those past times of God's faithfulness, those moments where God has met you, where God has revealed to you in a supernatural way who He is. Remember those moments when you see this place. And now rededicate yourself to experience God's presence anew. Remember what this spiritual landmark signifies. That God is here with us through the person of Jesus Christ. Remember, God has come down in this place.